Hello. Hey. Hey there. Uh, yes. Okay. We're all on. Perfect. Hi, everyone. What a packed house. Okay. So we are now live. Um, I'm going to do a short welcome and then I'll hand it over to you guys. So if you are still watching from the last session, you're still in Unlocked. For those of you who are just now signing on, this is the Unlock track of Consensus Distributed. It is an explainer track. It is built with learning in mind. So going step by step, how to become the ultimate crypto user. In these sessions, you're going to be able to interact with the speakers more. You're going to be, in, be able to interact with some of the technology that's so essential to this industry. Um, first, I'll start with a little housekeeping. I'm Bailey Reitzel. I'm a longtime crypto reporter who spent all of her Bitcoin on meetup beers and alpaca socks. So that super sucks for me. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll be hosting this session. I, myself, so Bailey Reitzel, and then another woman named Rachel O'Leary, we will be inside Brella. And so if there's questions that we can answer, we will be just responding to you either in the Q&A box or in the chat box. So feel free to use both of those and we will respond. If it's something that we want the speakers to answer, we will get to that. Uh, just hold tight. We will do it either at the end of some of the sessions or sort of on a rolling basis. So we are looking forward to seeing everybody engage here with us. Um, right now, this session is Bitcoin 101. The reason that we, we decided to put this on the schedule pretty late in the game, but that's because all of the Coindesk staffers kept getting asked, should I buy Bitcoin? Um, so there seems to be a lot of new blood in the industry right now, a lot of people wondering whether they should, and then after that, how? Um, so we have quite the panel today for you guys. We're gonna start with Jack Tatar. Um, he is with Doyle Capital Management, and he's also written a book called Crypto Assets. He wrote that with Chris Berninski. Um, he, I'm going to let him introduce his guests. Um, I know there's a lot of people here, um, but you're going to want to hear from all of them. So Jack, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Do, uh, uh, do I need to do anything to get me on the screen? Nope, or... you're on the screen. Okay, great. Terrific. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Bailey, for the introduction. Uh, as Bailey mentioned, um, I am uh, with uh, Doyle Capital Management. We, uh, we manage a uh, uh, venture fund that invests in transformative technology funds. We also do some private management of crypto assets. And that's what we're gonna talk a lot about today. Uh, and I've got my uh, research director, Ron Kochman, who is with us as well. Um, he's gonna give you some insights that I think you're gonna wanna stick around for uh, and, uh, and be part of here. Um, as uh, Bailey mentioned, uh, I've written a book, uh, Crypto Assets, uh, The Innovative Investor's Guide, Bitcoin and Beyond with Chris Berniski. I also wrote one of the first books on Bitcoin called What's the Deal with Bitcoins, uh, which is uh, which you can see is dated because Bitcoin is actually plural and singular, so it shouldn't be called Bitcoins, which Chris uh, corrected me on. Um, anyway, that being said, uh, before I get into it, uh, what would be great is if I could just have uh, my panelists introduce themselves as well. Uh, I'll start with uh, Ron, and then we can go to Jesus. Ron? Ron, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. You're on mute. Fortunately, he's better with numbers than uh, with uh, controls here. So, That's OK. Uh, it's confusing. Yeah, yeah. It's on the mute button. Uh, uh, Ron Kochman, uh, of, along with Jack, the managing directors of uh, Doyle Capital Management. Uh, I do. Uh, some of the research and my former life uh, CEO of a Fortune 1000 company for a while. Uh, been involved in Bitcoin for probably about uh, eight years now and other crypto assets and as Jack says, disruptive technologies. Great. Hey, Zip, <clears throat> introduce yourself. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you very much for, uh, for uh, having me. My name is Jesus Rodriguez. I'm currently the CEO of Into the Block, that we're a platform that uses data science to try to extract uh, intelligence uh, about the behavior of crypto assets. So we try to use cutting edge machine learning and data science to try to, to analyze patterns in, the, in crypto markets. I have had a, a long career as a, as a technologist with 10 years at Microsoft building quant systems at Wall Street, couple of successful exits as an entrepreneur and became a very active investor in both the artificial intelligence and crypto uh, fields. And now I have the opportunity of merging the two. 
Great. Thank you, Jesus. And we also have Jason. Jason, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Jason Lau. Um, I'm with OKCoin. Uh, I'm the COO there. And uh, OKCoin's a fiat to crypto uh, exchange. What that means is we allow users to buy crypto, Bitcoin, Litecoin, et cetera, using dollars and euros. And we were founded in China in 2013. So we've been in the space for, uh, it'll be our seventh anniversary later this year. Um, and myself personally, I've been also in the space for uh, about seven years now uh, with four years, the last four years being at OKCoin. Um, so thanks for having me here. Okay. Great, great, great. And I know we have, uh, I know Jason and Luis are gonna cover the, uh, the house section here. So Luis, you wanted to say a couple of uh, words here early on? Um, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, as you can see, it is not exactly daytime where I am. Your so background this is, is be... fabulous, though. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, we did kind of um, have a, a pretty, a pretty um, uh, deep uh, discussion ready for you guys uh, for the second half of the uh, the discussion. But so, but um, but for now, I'll just leave it at you know. Um, I've been in the in the Bitcoin industry for about five years now. I'm based out of uh, Southeast Asia. I'm in Manila currently, um, and I'm a big fan of kind of the financial revolution that's going on right now. Okay, great. Great, thank you so much. Thanks for being part of this. Um, as Bailey mentioned, we've got this broken up into two sections, kind of uh, why and the how here. So we're gonna, for the first 45 minutes, we're gonna cover the why, why Bitcoin, uh, why you should be, should or shouldn't be looking at buying Bitcoin now, and then the how we're gonna have Jason and Luis really get in depth here. But let's talk a little bit about why we should buy or should be looking at Bitcoin today. And I know this is a Bitcoin 101. Um, I have the feeling that many of you do know a little bit about Bitcoin, but let's talk about some of the basics for why you should be taking a look at Bitcoin. First of all, Bitcoin at this point uh, is a asset class, okay? You can take money into an exchange, and you can convert from fiat and put it into Bitcoin and, and view it as an investment for yourself. It's, your, it's, a, it's an asset class. Uh, once the exchanges opened up and they allowed you to do that, from my perspective, it became an investment. Now, as I said, I've been involved in this for a long time and I've seen a lot of people push back on it as an investment and as an investment vehicle. Let's take a look at some of the uh, specifics around Bitcoin. Today is a very special day um, in Bitcoin, because today is the halving, uh, which is something that happens every four years. And um, the reason that this happens is Bitcoin was created to develop just 21 million Bitcoin. That's it, no more uh, over time. Now we won't, none of us on this, uh, uh, on this panel will ever be around when the final Bitcoin is created, unless they come up with some sort of a, uh, a life enhancing type of thing, but we're looking at 100 plus years for when the final Bitcoin will be mined. But right now we're in a situation where, um, where the supply of Bitcoin that's been provided to miners halves today. And part of the, and the major reason for that is so that we don't get beyond 21 million Bitcoin being created. There's been a lot talked about the halving, and we're going to get into the specifics around that. But the key thing for you to think about, those of you who are familiar with this, who, who are not maybe not that familiar with it, is that Bitcoin will never have more than 21 million. Now, this is in direct contrast to what you've seen with the federal government, which right now, the, 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 world, the worrying you hear in, in your ear is actually the printing presses going on through the government, printing up more and more and more money out of thin air. Okay, that doesn't happen with Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a set schedule that can be created. Um, unlike the dollars where it can be, as many of them can be created as, as uh, the government decides to create. And we're seeing a lot of that right now with the stimulus. One thing that's very interesting is in 2008 when Bitcoin was created, it was actually created, uh, or I mean, there's a lot of discussion about this, but um, Bitcoin was created during the financial crisis of 2008, and it was actually referenced, in fact, in the first Genesis block that was created, uh, a news article related to the second government bailout uh, of 2008, uh, basically showing that the financial systems were not working properly, and now there was gonna be a bailout. I think we're up to about our fourth government bailout right now, 
Um, but this is a very important aspect, the fixed supply of Bitcoin. And we're going to throw some charts up there uh, as well for you. Hey, Zeus, I know you have some thoughts on this as well. Do you want to add some things from a macro level in terms of what you think are the reasons why um, Bitcoin, you know, I know we're going to get into some of the price aspects of it, but just from the macro level, why it's something for people to be looking at as an asset to invest in. Yeah, so I mean, we, we're going to present all sort of quantitative uh, metrics and analytics that sort of justify why Bitcoin is, is a good investment. But for a more, uh, let's say, generic perspective, it's the first asset class in many generations. So ignoring it, it just seems like a very silly thing to do. Uh, today, we don't know if Bitcoin is going to be the answer to the uncertainty in the markets, but we know that things like fixed income are going to go through very, very difficult time in, in generations to come. So being able to, uh, to uh, allocate uh, a percentage of your portfolio to something like Bitcoin, it makes a tremendous amount of sense. So I was... Um, Obviously, the, the, the crypto community react, uh, reacted very positively to the news last week of Paul Tudor Jones allocating part of his, uh, uh, his net worth into Bitcoin. I was uh, listening to an interview in CNBC this morning, actually, in which he said, look, you know, we allocate about one to two percent is very small, mostly as an as an, a speculative vehicle, not really like, I mean, there is no like a complete thesis around it, but, but what what they do know is that cash is in trouble, uh, right? And maybe Bitcoin is not the answer, but it, it might very well be. And it's a new asset class that is developing unique char characteristics. So it's, it's an exciting vehicle to be on. Okay. All right, great. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides here. And we're really going to get, uh, get into this here and get everyone's take on this. We are going to talk about the happening. We're going to get into detail on the happening. Uh, but I, what you see on your on your screen right now um, is uh, essentially the price of Bitcoin at this point in time. Um, so uh, you can see it's right around nine thousand uh, dollars up there. Um, that may be changing. This uh, this was obviously put on a little while ago. Uh, Bitcoin has gotten up to nineteen twenty thousand dollars in twenty seventeen. Uh, but you take a look at the numbers down below on the on the bottom right, and the reality is you're not going to see these returns in any other assets, okay? Once again, uh, and I'm, I'm going to say once again, but uh, from a de on a decade perspective, Bitcoin has been the best performing asset over the decade. And look at just the last five years. It has gone from $214 up to where it is today, which is $9,000, okay? Now, granted, there's volatility involved. There's a number of other things at play here. But the reality is, just from the, an investment perspective, the numbers speak for themselves. And over the last one year, uh, over the last 52 weeks, we've gone from 3,900 up to $9,000. Uh, that's over 126% uh, return. Uh, so from a pure price perspective, that is something to be taking a look at uh, as an investment option. Uh, let's take a look at the next the next screen if we could. Um, and this is a way that I evaluate Bitcoin and take a look at Bitcoin. You've got to recognize a couple of things that are at play here with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a very volatile asset, okay? I mean, we've seen a lots of swings. You saw there, 19,000 at one point in 2017, we're down to 9,000. There's a lot of swings there. It is a young asset class. This is going to happen. One of the things that we do to gauge that from an investment perspective, and I come to this from, with 25 years of financial, um, financial services experience, is to evaluate this through something called the Sharpe Ratio, which basically says, look, you're going to take a certain amount of risk. What is the reward that you're going to get for that? You take high risk for high reward, but you also, also add volatility into your portfolio. This is a chart that Willie Wu has put out there, and he updates it pretty regularly. And once again, this year and, and over all the other asset classes, the risk adjusted return versus all the other asset classes, it just blows it away. You saw a little bit of the stocks coming up there and coming near Bitcoin, but then a drop off and Bitcoin uh, based on its sharp ratio just returns um, a high level of returns there uh, based on the sharp ratio aspect of it. Now, the thing that's important 
from my perspective, looking at this, and this is a big part that we wrote in the book, Crypto Assets, is viewing this in the context of your overall investment portfolio. Uh, typically, most people have an investment portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds, or something like that. That's been called the, the typical 60-40 uh, portfolio allocation. The reality is with uh, firms like um, Coin, uh, Coinbase, where you can buy crypto and some of the other returns, some of the other products that are out there, and we're going to talk about that later on with Luis, you can add this to your overall portfolio, albeit maybe not in the same account, but from the perspective of your own portfolio allocation. And I view, I view um, Bitcoin as a non-correlated alternative asset. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because when I say non-correlated, meaning that what we saw in 2008 was stocks and bonds move similar to each other. Um, and when they both went, and when one debt went down, they both went down when they were supposed to be moving uh, against each other. Uh, and we needed a non-correlated asset to, um, to provide more flexibility uh, within a portfolio. And that's where we saw alternative assets come into play. And typically, if you talk to any of the wealth management firms out there, they will tell you to take a look at five, 10, maybe 15% of your overall portfolio into alternative assets, which for the most part is often referred to as gold. Um, Bitwise has recently done a report and where they basically said, if you add 2.5% of Bitcoin into your portfolio, take a look at the increase in return. Now, 2.5% is not a lot, okay? So even for the regular investor out there uh, who maybe doesn't believe in crypto uh, or whatever, you go from a 24% portfolio, 60, 40%, to a 2.5% Bitcoin allocation, not doing any rebalancing, you've increased that overall portfolio up to 42% from 2014 to 2020. And there's some other aspects of rebalancing that go on in there as well. These are important reasons why you should be taking a look at this into your own portfolio. Uh, Jack, do, do you feel that applies to any size of portfolio? Like whether you're looking at complex macro portfolios with a ton of vehicles or more simply 60-40 split of uh, fixed income and equities? Well, I think the 60-40 model is based on equities and um, um, and fixed income. Now, if you're asking if, if, if somebody's investing $100 into something, everyone should invest based on their own financial goals and their own financial situation. So if you are building an investment portfolio, I think you should be taking a look at putting Bitcoin in there, um, depending on uh, whatever, you've, whatever you've invested in. Now, you talk about institutional money. Just recently, we had Paul Tudor Jones, who runs a big institution, a big hedge fund person. He's now putting 2% of his portfolio, which is millions and millions of dollars, and maybe even billions, I don't know, RK, RK maybe billions, um, into this and as, as a way for some diversification. So I think it can play into anybody's size, size of portfolio. Uh, RK, do you have a, a view on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the two and a, you know, anywhere from one to 5% of somebody's portfolio should be in alternative assets. And when I say alternative assets, I mean Bitcoin. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so here you can see some charts where even increasing it into that zero to 10%, you see some of the returns that are happening there. I think one of the problems that, that people have, and how you, Luce, you mentioned this, the typical investor, they may have a financial advisor and their financial advisor is supposed to be doing re fiduciary responsibility to them to get their highest returns based on their financial goals. Financial advisors are not allowed for the most part to even discuss crypto and Bitcoin with investors. So this is something that investors have to go off and unfortunately at this point in time, do on their own. But taking a look at adding a small amount of of Bitcoin into your portfolio, here are the returns. Um, so it's a very, very important asset in terms of diversification. And I go back to my point about it being a non-correlated asset, which is alternative, which is where I think alternative assets fit. Now, there's been discussions about uh, correlation and those types of things, and we've seen a number of items around that. Hey, Zeus, I'd like you to add uh, maybe your comments here on correlation, because I know you and I've had a number of discussions around correlation and how that plays into how people should look at adding Bitcoin into their portfolio. 
Yeah, I mean the the overarching theme on in the in the market, I guess part of the the culture on Bitcoin as an investment vehicle was that it was a non-correlated asset. I always felt that one, the, the, as an asset class, Bitcoin is just too young to to judge against uh, you know asset classes like equities or or commodities, and it's also too small, right, compared to to what is being held on the on the S and P. Uh, 500. Certainly, this crisis has proved uh, has proven part of that thesis wrong that Bitcoin has has acted in some correlation with uh, uh, with equities. Uh, in the in the in a couple of slides, we're gonna discuss a thesis that a couple of researchers out of University of Santa Clara, California, came up with that I find one of the most fascinating uh, thesis in terms of where the correlation with uh, Bitcoin and other asset classes is. But what is true is that in different market. Uh, times it has behaved differently. Sometimes it has shown uh, no, uh, uh, it has behaved as a non-correlated asset and sometimes have shown some very, very, very strong correlation. Yeah, so I'd like to, to weigh in on that one, Jack, along yeah. with, as well as with your, uh, your rebalancing uh, uh, issue. First yeah. of all, I don't believe in rebalancing, right? Rebalancing is basically selling a profitable asset for and buying an asset that's losing money or, or, or underperforming. So I just don't think that's proper investment thesis. I think every time you make an investment, you're, you're setting your price targets of what you think that, that investment will get to when you will sell. And I think that's the way you should handle it, not rebalance, but you know, when you reach your profit targets, you, 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 you sell or, or, or whatever. Um, you know, I prefer the, especially for the younger investors out there, uh, I prefer doing more of the, the balanced portfolio. If you're going to invest two and a half percent of your of your uh, investment, uh, you know, portfolio into Bitcoin, well, then invest that two and a half percent. You know, I, I I believe in you know, if you're going to do a 401k, I'd be buying you know one to two percent every month in Bitcoin. So I believe in you know, Bitcoin should be two and a half percent of your investment not of your portfolio. Once you invest your, your one or 2% in Bitcoin, let your portfolio, let it grow. And if it winds up being two, three, five, 10% of it, well, fine. That's, that's, that's what we call a good investment. There's no reason to sell a good investment and then, uh, you know, reallocate it somewhere else. Um, I think, you know, yep. go ahead, I, I mean, I think this is, this is a discussion that RK and I have had a number of times. I fall back to the old financial services model of rebalancing and the Bitwise uh, report uh, talked about rebalancing there, which is basically going in quarterly and saying, let's make sure that you don't have either beyond a two and a half percent or a 5% allocation and you bring it down and you sell. Um, if you follow that, the returns are good, but on a long-term perspective, it can really hinder you. And for a young investor, I think, I think Ron makes a great point from a young investor, you put two and a half percent of what you want to invest, and whether this is automated through through uh, Coinbase or whatever, and I know Luis and, and Jason are going to talk about that later, um, and just leave it there. So th there's the different perspectives there about uh, rebalancing and allocation. But my my point here is that for the person looking to get involved in Bitcoin, look at it from a piece of your portfolio, your overall portfolio allocation. Should a young person invest more in Bitcoin than someone my age? Absolutely. You have a longer time frame for it. Okay. Should you invest everything into Bitcoin? Absolutely not uh, because of the volatility there. So there's all those different things that, that people have to come into play here. Um, Jesus, I put up on the screen here some of, I think, your slides around the correlation. Perfect. Um, so maybe help me guide you walk through these or you can walk us through them. Absolutely. So this is a, uh, a thesis that I encountered recently in, in, uh, in a quant research uh, website. It comes out of uh, the University of Santa Clara, California. And to me, it was, uh, it was very illustrative because today when we think about the correlation between Bitcoin and traditional asset classes and all or nothing, right? It's either correlated or not. What, what these researchers try to explain is that up to this point, 
Bitcoin has be, has behaved to what we call in quant circles as a, as a high sentiment beta asset, which the definition of high sentiment beta is something like uh, when, let's say, investors get really, really excited about large cap, uh, you know, Fang stock, Apple, Microsoft, Netflix, and all that, they also happen to get even more excited about other stocks that are probably they don't they don't have the 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 same fundamentals as those in the Russell 2000 or smaller cap. But at the same token, when when they become bearish about large caps, that that effect also permeates into uh, a smaller cap with an even uh, a higher degree. So. They, they look at the performance of Bitcoin across the, uh, and correlations with other asset class across a bunch of uh, different years. And you can see in this chart that when they, the, this is a famous drop in, of March 11, when you see that a, a sharp drop in equities, it follow, uh, you know, a few years, days after we had a sharp drop in, uh, in the price of Bitcoin. If we go to the next slide, uh, you can see the study that, that uh, that uh, compares the performance of Bitcoin with different asset classes across a bunch of years. And you can see that equities, when equities were up in an average of four, four point, over 4%, Bitcoin was up, right? And also with the other asset classes, the correlation was not very clear, right? So we have seen a sporadic moments of Bitcoin having a high correlation with gold and then having no correlation with gold whatsoever. But with equities, it's very consistent. And then we, when equities were down, and by equities, we mean the S&P 500. Uh, when equities were, were down, then Bitcoin was really, really down uh, following. So the, the correlation there, it seems that uh, uh, that it was very strong. Now, this study is, for, is uh, from about a year ago. So let's look at what happened in March 11. So let's go to the next slide. And you can see this is the, a chart of the S&P 500 ETF that mimics the S&P 500 index. You can see that prior to March 11, we had a, a big spike and then a sharp decline on equities. And obviously that followed a collapse on the price of Bitcoin that almost brought down the, the network. But if we want to see, that's at a macro level, just looking at price. But if we want to see uh, a chart that is very illustrative of what happened by just following the behavior of individual investors. The next slide shows an analysis that we do in the Into the Block platform that looks at the flows going in and out of exchanges. This one in particular looks at all the crypto exchanges, it's a centralized crypto exchange by way, what they report at the blockchain level. And uh, the, first, uh, the first chart shows price. The second one shows the inflows and outflows. So money coming in and money coming out, but the third chart shows a difference. So you can see that as price was declining, there was a massive inflow of money into exchanges to be liquid, to liquidate Bitcoin. So what that tells you is equities went down and then that effect ripple into Bitcoin and then uh, investors start liquidating their Bitcoin positions by moving money into exchanges and liquidating uh, and liquidating that price. And I think, Ron, you have some thesis about this as well. Oh, I have a thesis about everything, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, I, mean, I, I have discussions all the time with Jack and others about this. Look, there are underlying fundamentals of, of equities, gold, and uh, Bitcoin that will make them uncorrelated at different times, right? With, with stocks, you have, you, have, you have earnings, you have you know, uh, uh, news events and things like that. But if you look what happened in March, right, to, to Bitcoin, gold, stocks, look, they, everything is correlated to risk on, risk off, right? There's no avoiding that when, you, when you're talking about an investment. There's market risk that goes along with everything. And when... When when everything's great, everything goes up. When everything's shit, everything goes down, right? And that's when you see the the high correlation is when either everything's booming or everything's just crashing. And that's what the correlation is is saying where the hell am I going to get money to pay my bills next month or where to invest? Is you liquidate, you know, your stocks, your 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 gold and your Bitcoin. What, I, what I've been finding the last couple of months is both with Bitcoin and gold, 
uh, especially when the markets, when the equity markets are closed, they will be highly correlated to the futures, uh, the equity futures market. Because you know when, when if the, the market's going to open, the stock market's going to open up down 200 points, people are looking to know they have margin requirements and margin calls coming in, and they're going to sell Bitcoin and sell gold to, to cover those margin, those margin calls. So I'm saying, you know, risk on, risk off, you're not going to avoid, uh, you're going to have to be highly correlated anytime that happens. And this is, this is an example of that correlation you're talking about. Right, uh, to, 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 right. To, to, uh, this is, you know, think about the, uh, I just looked at the S&P 500. I looked at the NASDAQ as figuring right now, the S&P is, you got a lot of, I believe the technical word is shit in the S&P. Whereas the NASDAQ, you could line up more with Bitcoin simply because the NASDAQ is future technology, right? The stay at home, you know, type of businesses and things like that. Uh, and, I, and I really, you know, line up sort of Bitcoin as new technology that goes along with the NASDAQ. And you'll see how highly co uh, correlated they are over the last. Uh, and NASDAQ is, a, is an index that has performed really well in this, yeah. in this financial cri crisis, right? It's positive for the year, which is, which is crazy, right? Thinking about the, the recession that we're going through. It is in double digits, whereas the regular S&P is in, still in negative. Uh, but let me go into the happening here. Um, we could spend we, a lot of time um, on all these things. So, sure. yeah, sorry, let's... Jack. Let me ask yeah. you guys a couple questions, just because there's some in the Q&A box, and then we can go into the happening after that. Sure. Um, so we had a question from Anonymous. For boomers who are looking to retire soon, how can they allocate a percentage of their portfolio to Bitcoin safely as a hedge against pension defaults? I think you guys talked about this a little, but maybe reiterate. Um, well, the judge, I, I, so I'm, I'm also not a fan of, of, especially with Bitcoin, dollar cost averaging, simply because you get opportunities in Bitcoin if you want to get involved, there are opportunities when you should be getting involved. And Jack, I have a chart on that later. I, I'll, I'll go through that one, but for now I'll leave the rest. I, right, right. And whereas, whereas I am an advocate of dollar cost averaging, uh, especially for young investors. So for young investors, I would say get into an automated uh, investment thing on maybe like, you know, Coinbase or something where uh, you put a certain amount of your uh, of your paycheck or whatever into Bitcoin and just leave it there. And on a dollar cost average basis, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to follow the market. You just leave it there. Um, and then for anyone who's younger, uh, who can take the risk, potentially you may want to take more than the two and a half, five percent, maybe 10 percent uh, allocation into um, into Bitcoin. Uh, it also for many for many young investors, Bitcoin is a way to introduce pe uh, people in how, on how to invest and how to allocate their resources. So, um, I mean, hopefully that helps. Okay, and then we have one other question. Um, sure. If you wanna stop sharing your screen, whoever's sharing it, then people can more easily see somebody talking um, and then you can just share it again. Um, okay, so the main, yeah. this is kind of a long one. This is from CFA Charter Holder. So shout out to that person who's asking questions. Thanks so much. Um, the main input to asset allocation models is the expected return for an asset class. Um, sorry. It jumped on me, where is it? Okay, how can you estimate the expected return for Bitcoin? Any historical numbers that rely on the previous run-up bubble are highly misleading as you can get any number you want by using a different time period. Agree. Oh, right. <laughs> um, if, uh, I, you know, I can send out my crystal ball to that person if they'd like to see what how to predict this. But uh, I mean, this is the whole reason to uh, be taking a look at it, uh, taking a look at it and spending the time evaluating this. We do a lot of technical analysis and we do a lot of working with, with uh, websites and platforms like he Jesus who are doing some deep dives into what's going on in the Bitcoin blockchain. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to evaluate where the price is going. Uh, like I say, we use technical analysis. The thing you've got to be very careful of is we've got, uh, we've got about 12 years of history now with Bitcoin, not even 12 years because it has only been trading uh, less than that period of time. Um, so we have some past data, uh, whether or not that data is, um, is, is credible to evaluate 
Uh, I think we're getting there, but we keep u- utilizing it. Uh, if you want to go and look at a, a something like Ethereum or younger crypto assets on a historical basis, you really can't do it because there's not a lot of data out there. So um, I, I would say you've got to, you know, you got to take a look at technicals. You got to take a look at what's available on websites. Hey, Zeus, any any insights you have to that question? Yeah. So I, I guess from from the point of view of portfolio management, the art of of any portfolio strategy is uh, once you decide on an allocation that is in this case, like Jack was saying, like around two percent. That is small enough. How you how you start incrementing those by increase the reward without increasing the risk, right? You always have to have that. Uh, uh, that balance, and in that case, it is true that uh, big uh, Bitcoin is uh, um, is has had uh, a lot of periods of un- instability that makes it uh, unpredictable. But at the same token, keep in mind that as an asset class, we have more data about Bitcoin than we have about many other asset classes okay. because of the records on the blockchain. And throughout different time periods, it becomes very predictable. Like we're doing work on that, on, on using uh, ML models, to machine learning models to try to, to predict uh, the fluctuations in price across short periods of time. And it does become predictable. Obviously, you know, it's, it's still very vulnerable to macro conditions. Right. Right. So let me, let me, Bailey, if I could, let me yeah, get, go through, ahead. Go ahead. get through these rather quickly, because I do want to get to some of those things about technical analysis. And then I do want to get, um, get into uh, uh, the aspects of how. Uh, so right now we're in the halvening. This has happened two other times. This is the third time. That means that miners are now receiving half of the amount of Bitcoin rewards that they received before. You're seeing a lot about it, a lot of things that have, have, that have uh, been written about it. Um, in actuality, in regards to the price, this is probably the most boring uh, aspect of the fact that we have the halvening today because the price doesn't matter at this point in time. What matters is that there's this two to two and a half year window. And once again, we're going back and looking at past, um, past information. The last two halvings, and you can see here, first halving uh, back in 2012, second one in 2016, and now the new one here in 2019. What you, what you had happen with the last two halvings is so similar that it, it, it requires us to look at um, this example in what's happening right now. And that is that about a year before the actual halving, Bitcoin hit a bottom. Whether, I will not say it's the bottom, but it hit a bottom, it hit a base, a support level. The halving happens about a year after that. And then 12 to 18 months after that, what happens is it reaches an all time high. You can see that happening in the first halving there. And we saw it happen in the second halving uh, as well. That, that, two and a half year window. So what are we seeing now in, in the third uh, happening? A year before, we potentially reached a bit of a bottom. We've seen a little bit of a run up, but if this, if this follows the last two examples, 12 to 18 months from now, we could be hitting another new all time high. And that all time high could be above $20,000. Okay, so for those people who are looking at why should I be investing in Bitcoin and taking a look at past, past information, there's a story there with the happening, um, but you don't buy it because today is the happening. You buy it because potentially where this can be 12 to 18 months from now. Um, and one last point on this, and I'm just going to throw this out there just to kind of uh, give you a little bit of a large view from a, a gentleman uh, who puts up a great Twitter feed, Plan B, and he's done this stock to flow analysis uh, where it takes existing supply to the new supply. He actually targets this out based on the happening. And he has expectations for following this chart for Bitcoin getting up into the 280 plus area within by 2024, if it follows similar charts. So this goes back to the point that we mentioned before about using tools of analysis from past data to try and figure out where is Bitcoin going in the future. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to fly through the happening, but I, I kind of did there because I do want to get to some charts that we have out there to talk about the current situation and a way to put technical analysis to evaluating this. But Jesus, Ron, anything on the happening that I may have missed that should be pointed out? No, just ignore it. <laughs> no, I, uh, 
I do have some uh, some interesting uh, insights that just looking at the behavior of individual uh, investors. So one of the things that is very unique uh, about uh, about Bitcoin and about crypto assets in general is the fact that by analyzing blockchain data, you can get an understanding of patterns about the behavior of behavior of individual investors, which is nearly impossible to extrapolate. Uh, but in other asset classes, by just, just looking on price and volume. So instead of trying to make a prediction about the halvening, uh, we're trying to understand what's happening underneath and try from the behavioral standpoint to uh, sort of detect patterns about the behavior of key groups of investors. So for instance, one thing that we uh, that we uh, discover is that the number of addresses that are holding over 100, uh, 100 Bitcoins is on an all-time high. So these are long-term holders, whales, non-exchange addresses that are holding large amounts of Bitcoin. And these people are staying in it for the long time and they keep accumulating. So that's important because it means that Bitcoin is gonna have good levels of support at different, uh, at different points based on, on the positions of these investors. Now, those are the large investors, the people with a lot of money, long-term holders, people that are very bullish about this. But how about you know, a smaller segments of, of the investor base? So the next slide will show you addresses that are holding basically one Bitcoin. Right, like a very basic investment around uh, six to eight thousand dollars, and that number is also an at all time high. So we've seen uh, the number of whales, the positions of whale being increased at an all time high, but also the uh, the small uh, the small investors uh, growing at an all time high uh, as well. So another metric that uh, that is uh, typically we use a lot in blockchain analysis is uh, addresses, right? Like how is the, the network underneath Bitcoin or any asset behaving? Addresses is typically a misleading metrics because exchanges create addresses all the time for doing things. And so you need to qualify it a bit. So if the next slide will show you a metric that is addresses holding a positive balance and that's also on an all time high. So we can see the number of addresses in the network that are holding some balance that is not addresses created by exchange that are holding zero balance is also an at all time high. So the network is active. People are, are participating and there is momentum going into, into the events of uh, going into the events of today. Also related to the halvening, uh, uh, an analogy that obviously people relate a lot to miners, right? Because this is gonna have an impact in the block reward of the network. So the hash rate, which is a metric that is used to, uh, to quantify the miner activity in the network, since the last, uh, how many, if we go to the next slide, has increased, but has increased by 8,000%, which is insane. So people, the, the, uh, the miners are getting ready for this and, uh, and they have been preparing for a while and there's more and more mining activity Coming, uh, coming into the network. So uh, just to close this point, I have two metrics to show you that I think are fascinating. So if you wanna see how, uh, how much activity is going into Bitcoin uh, for, for the events of today, one metric that we find fascinating is to look at the flows of money going into exchanges as we show you as the beginning. But let's look at the flows going into reputable exchanges, let's say like Binance, uh, one of our customers. So go, go to, to our next, uh, to the next slide. So if you look at the, uh, at this chart and look at the inventory being held by Binance is the second chart from the bottom. That's a number of Bitcoins that are being held on the Binance call wallet, whole wallet, deposit addresses on everything, the architecture of the exchange. You can see how that has been increasing. And it has been increasing together with the price. So it follows the price movement. So more and more money is being sitting in, in uh, Binance. Now, if I look at the, at the entire population of crypto exchanges, which includes a lot of other exchanges that probably don't have the reputation of Coinbase, Binance, or Kraken. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that, uh, uh, that the number of, of Bitcoins being held in those addresses is actually decreasing. 
which means more funds, more Bitcoins are being accumulated in the good exchanges and not so, uh, and not so much in the, in the bad exchanges. So people are getting smarter about this. As we go through more of these events, the market is, uh, is, getting, is getting really smarter. And then I know you guys have some, some perspective from the technical standpoint uh, as well. Well, okay. I just want to, um, okay. we're going to have to jump to the how section pretty soon. Okay. Um, I think you guys have definitely convinced some people because in the Q&A in the chat, we're definitely getting, oh, okay, cool. How do we buy? How do we buy? Right. Um, so, uh, which is also kind of scary to be fair, but um, let's just go ahead and jump over to the how. Um, I don't know who's screen sharing, but if they can drop it. Then... Right, 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 right. We have, can we just, can we, would, would it be okay if we just gave you one quick chart here? Okay, fine. Show the, show the chart. Is that yes. all right? Is that all right? Thank you, guys. <laughs> yes, Thanks. that's fine. Thanks. RK, hit it quickly. Here's okay, the technical okay. chart that we've been looking at that we think is, is worth the price. For okay, so, so for anybody who wants to know when to buy or when to sell, this is the chart you need. Um, this is simply the 20-week uh, exponential moving average and the 200 week moving average. You can use dailies or whatever, you know, for short term trading, but you want to do long term trading. It's the 20 week exponential moving average. And what you'll find here is anytime the trend line is moving up is good for Bitcoin. Anytime it's down, it's bad for Bitcoin. And this goes back to 2014. And just looking at when the trend lines changed, if you bought and sold on the change of trend lines uh, on them, uh, you'd say, I think there were uh, 12 buys and sells in totals over the last six years. And there are only, I think, one, two, maybe three false buys signals that you got on, during downtrends. But when you got a change in the direction of the trend line and each of the big three um, uh, shaded areas there, if you sold when that trend line changed from going up to not just flattening, but going down, you would have saved yourself the three biggest drops in Bitcoin of 50% or more. 20 week not day, 20 week exponential average. And then I just wanted to highlight the 200 week exponential average, oh, sorry, the 200 week moving average, which called the bottom exactly in 2019 and was pretty close to calling the bottom, was off by a week in the early 2020. But what I wanna highlight here is where we are right now. Even though we're getting a buy signal right now because the 20 week EMA is moving up, okay? We've broken through the big trend line that we, that we have there, the solid line on the bottom, okay? The 200 uh, week moving average did not hold even though it recovered. And now we are getting up to the, to test the point of the, uh, the, the 20, uh, 20 week EMA right now. This is a crucial point for Bitcoin. This, I think in the next month will determine what Bitcoin, what does to Bitcoin for the next two or three years. If we can retake uh, that channel and, and resume the uptrend above 12,000, we can go to 30 or 40,000. If we don't, we're probably going to at least go down to 5,700. So okay. Watch the chart. Thank you, RK. Thank you, Luis. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Bailey, for letting us uh, take a little bit extra time there. Hopefully that was helpful. I will stop the share and send it cool. over to the How Boys. Okay, excellent. All right. Uh, also, Jack, Ron, Jesus, if you guys had slides, if you could uh, dump them to me at, in some way, an email or something like that, there's a lot of people who were kind of interested in having those. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll try to figure out how to give our attendees those slides at some point. 
Um, okay, so moving on to the how, um, our host for this part is Luis Buenaventura. He's from Bloom Solutions and is also CryptoPop. If you've seen the art, which I'm sure you have if you're in crypto, very cool guy. Um, he's going to be explaining how to buy Bitcoin, whether that's through an exchange, through another person in a dark alley, all of these things. Um, so Luis, go ahead, take it away. Thanks so much, Bailey. Thanks, Jack, guys. Uh, that was pretty awesome. You know, I was um, so so. I'm, as you can see, I'm not coming from you from the west or east coast. I'm about twelve hours into the future, and um, this is my energy level for two in the morning. This is exactly how I am uh, at this time of night. Um, I guess I I, I kind of wanted to highlight how how in the spirit of decentralization, our two presentations could not be further from each other. Um, I guess the, the thing that I am really, really excited about when I teach people about Bitcoin, I always kind of think about kind of the, the very average type of person. And um, I think the presentation that I'm about to give is very much a reflection of kind of the types of people that I talk to uh, when, I, when, I, when I have these types of conversations. Um, so I am going to share my screen now and I, I think you'll see what I mean very shortly. So this is... Um, this is the how of Bitcoin. How do you buy it? How do you store it? Um, how does all of that stuff work? I'm and going to spend this is the... all. Uh, this is all <laughs> yeah. his artwork. So if you like it, then now you know where to get it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. So I'm. I'm just going to spend the first five to ten minutes speaking quite quickly about some fundamental stuff that we need to know, and then um, I'm going to introduce our first guest, um, and he's going to tell you in a lot more detail about like exactly how to get into it. Right. So. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just get right into it now. Um, so first question, how do we actually hold Bitcoin? Um, you know, the metaphor works. Uh, Bitcoin is money, therefore you put it in a wallet. Um, but there is the question of uh, custody. Um, you know, coins in your pocket, um, that's yours. You're the one holding it. You have full responsibility over the, that, uh, those coins or paper bills or whatever. Um, but if you put those bills in the bank, now it's kind of the bank's accountability, right? So if they get, um, you know, whatever, um, if, if there's a robbery or whatever, your money doesn't just suddenly just disappear. They have some accountability to you. So same holds true in the world of Bitcoin, where, um, you know, you could either choose to hold it yourself or you can entrust it to someone else. And the term for that is custodial versus non-custodial uh, Bitcoin wallets. So if you are planning on being brave and tech savvy and holding this stuff yourself, um, that means you're going the non-custodial route. And if you are going to uh, entrust it to a big brand name, um, have somebody else kind of worry about the security part, um, that's a custodial solution. So I'm just gonna go really quickly through these so that we have some fundamental information as we kind of go to the other parts of the discussion. So um, first thing you should know, this is super important, there's no such thing as the official Bitcoin wallet. That does not exist. The reason why that is, is because Bitcoin is an open source technology that every developer in the world can look at, make a copy of, um, add features to if they wanted to, all of that stuff, right? Um, kind of in the same way as there is no such thing as the official browser for the internet. Like you can have Chrome and Firefox and whatever Microsoft is doing these days and Apple Safari and all of that stuff. And that's fine. Um, you know, may the best man win. Same thing with Bitcoin wallets. So on the left side of the screen, um, you have brands like Coinbase, Robinhood, Cash App. And if you guys are familiar with some of these names, you know, like you'll know that they're not only Bitcoin wallets. There are a bunch of other things that they can do. Um, uh, Robinhood, obviously, for stocks. Cash can actually buy stocks as well. Um, but um, these are kind of uh, hardly representative of all of the choices out there. In fact, if you just did a very blind search on, say, the App Store, for Bitcoin wallet, you'll get like literally hundreds of results, right? Because there are so many choices. Um, on the right side of my screen, a couple of brands that I happen to really like, uh, BRD, you say bread, so it's bread wallet. Uh, the, uh, the green address wallet, I really like also. And then Mycelium, kind of an old classic for the people who, are, who have been around for a really long time. Now, 
Um, again, this is, these are not endorsements. And in fact, this is hardly even an indicator of how many choices there actually are out there. But these are just kind of um, some of the ones that I personally have had some uh, experience with and I, I, I generally like. Um, but ultimately, I think the, the biggest takeaway um, for this entire session should be that there is so much uh, stuff to learn and you should, you know, we're trying to arm you with just enough information that you can kind of make your own choices, but also kind of, you know, figure out how to do your own research, right? Um, put, we want to, we aim to put you down a path where you will know what questions to ask and you will be able to um, kind of arm yourself with the, the necessary information to make these decisions better. Um, so you're going to see this format uh, across a lot of the, the rest of this discussion. We're going to do a pros and a cons for everything that we talk about. Sorry. Hello? Seem to have a minor... You're good. We can hear you. We can hear you. Am I still on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I've just lost my audio. It's okay. Um, I'm just going to keep talking. So um, pros and cons, right? Um, with the uh, with with custodial wallets, the pros are kind of obvious. Um, you know, there's usually a pretty nice built-in way to uh, buy Bitcoin. Um, and then um, they also have, uh, they possibly might have insurance against things like theft or accidents or things like that. Um, and also the security protocols will feel pretty familiar if you're the type of person who's ever had any kind of mobile wallet. And what that means is that, you know, you'll have the email, the password, you'll have two-factor authentication, you have things like that. Um, so it won't seem very different really from anything else that you've done. If you've gotten, if you've ever had a PayPal account, if you've ever had like a Venmo account, then you'll, these things will feel familiar to you. Now, the cons for your average custodial wallet are that technically you're not actually holding that Bitcoin because same, same way as when you deposit your dollars into a bank, you're not actually holding those dollars, right? And um, it, may, it might not be a massive difference to some people, but to others, it does make a difference um, who has ultimate control over the Bitcoin that you supposedly own. Um, you know, in the, in the Bitcoin uh, world, we have this saying, uh, if it's uh, not your keys, not your coins. And what that means is that if you don't hold the, the keys to your uh, Bitcoin, then it's not really your Bitcoin. And obviously, that's kind of a, a pretty extreme way to think about it, but that's not necessarily wrong either, because you are entrusting, um, you know, kind of your money to someone else. And that's kind of the, the trade-off for all of the great features that you get for these custodial wallets. Uh, the trade-off is that you're technically not holding your Bitcoin anymore. Another um, possible problem is that um, you... you um, you will have to worry about the kind of the limits and restrictions of uh, of those custodial wallets. So, you know, if there are some pretty good rules, uh, if there are some, if there are some pretty uh, strict rules, I should say, um, then you will have to kind of abide by them. And that might be stuff like, you know, if you need to send a large amount out to someone else, there will be some waiting time while they evaluate what that money is for, kind of like a bank. And, you know, if you're the type of person who got into this stuff because you were maybe not so happy about traditional banks, then maybe that's not for you. Um, the last con, and this one is kind of a, I guess it really depends on where you're kind of where you're coming from, um, is that, you know, identification tends to be mandatory for these things. So you do have to tell, uh, you have to, you identify yourself to both the platform and the, the operator of the wallet, right? And for some people, not a big deal. For others, could be a, big, a very big deal. So um, it is kind of uh, one of those things where your mileage may vary. Just forgive me for one moment. I'm going to try and put my headset back on. Okay. I think that's a little better. Okay. Um, this is my last slide, and, and then I'm going to move on to uh, my introducing our guests. Uh, pros and cons for non-custodial wallets. Um, 
best one, in my opinion, you download it and you're, and you're going immediately, right? Um, with, with examples like these, BRD, uh, green, mycelium, you, you pull them down from the app store and you're literally ready to accept Bitcoin at that point, right? Um, and so there's not even, uh, there's no, you don't have to, you know, um, you don't have to uh, sign up. You don't have to give them your email. You don't have to do any of those things. Um, the, the, be the next best thing about it is that you also hold your own Bitcoin. So this is what, the, again, um, like what we said previously, this is uh, you um, taking control, taking responsibility for your money. Um, and it is a, about as dangerous as walking around with, um, you know, kind of your cash in your pocket. So you do have to learn to keep this stuff safe. Um, but again, this is something that you make, you, you, it's your decision to make. And that's kind of what makes this stuff so powerful. Um, and also because it's, it is as good as cash in your pocket, there are no limits or restrictions. You can do whatever you want with it. You can send it to whoever you want. Uh, and you're not going to have to ask for permission from anyone, which is um, a distinct advantage. Um, the last pro that I wrote down here uh, is that you could uh, get access to the latest Bitcoin tech. Now, what for, for most people, that's probably not going to be super relevant for the but for the the enthusiasts, the people who are kind of who like to be on the bleeding edge of things, um, it's these um, it's these non-custodial wallets that are the most uh, bleeding edge, right? So you'll get to see this new stuff as it comes out, uh, which is a hell of a lot more fun. Um, and then there are three cons. Um, and as you can probably imagine, it's kind of the ones that are, uh, it will turn some people off for sure. Uh, the first is that, you know, kind of the idea of security when you are working with a, 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 a non-custodial Bitcoin wallet it tends to have a little bit of a learning curve. Um, I'm not gonna go into kind of the details of it, but I guess suffice to say that um, when you see that initial backup phrase, you will realize that this is a completely different world and it could be um, very different from anything that you've ever seen before. Um, again, if uh, because it is yours and yours alone, if you lose things like your backup phrase, uh, your private key, things like that. Um, no one is going to help you find that stuff in the sense that, you know, it's not like when you, you know, forget your password in your Gmail, there is a way to, you know, kind of regain access to it. Um, you don't get stuff like that for free in Bitcoin. It, it doesn't really exist. So you will have to work extra hard to make sure that there's always a way for you to find this stuff. Um, and then, Lastly, um, there's going to be slightly more steps involved if you want to buy and sell uh, crypto, if you, if you use stuff like this. As I was explaining earlier, with the custodial solutions like Cash App or Coinbase or Robinhood, right? all of the trading elements are, are just you know, kind of buttons in the same interface. So you can kind of do everything you want right there. Um, and it's already all kind of working. Um, with, uh, with the non-custodial solutions, there's this tendency that you then have to kind of go somewhere else uh, to, to buy your first Bitcoin or, or whatever it is. Um, so, okay. And that's it for the first half of what I was saying. Now we can kind of go into the, the how do we actually buy stuff. So in order for this to work, I need to make sure that my headphones are working. Um, Okay. Is anyone else unmuted right now? I'm unmuted right now. Okay, awesome, great. Okay, there you go. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, I just had to make sure that my audio was working. No, it would be okay. pretty hard to do an interview if I can't hear the person that I speak. <laughs> It'd be pretty funny. Um, okay, so there are a ton of ways to buy Bitcoin, but I'm gonna uh, focus this discussion on two. The first is uh, what we call a marketplace. And um, what that is, if you've ever tried to buy anything over eBay, um, then you'll know what that is. A marketplace is where buyers and sellers coordinate, um, you know, uh, agree on a price. And then if, if, if it all goes well, then, you know, you, you 
acquire your the Bitcoin that you wanted, right? Um, I'm going to uh, present this part with uh, Ray Youssef, the, the founder of uh, Paxful. So Ray and I have never actually uh, met or spoke, um, but I'm deeply, deeply familiar with his startup um, because um, you know my company trades on Paxful. Um, you know, dozens of times every day. So I'm a, you know, a very big fan of what his, his uh, doing over there. Um, Ray, um, maybe you can unmute yourself and um, just kind of like, just talk us through kind of the, um, you know, this is the Paxful story. Like, how did you guys get started? Um, maybe a little bit about your background also. Hey everybody, what's up? My name is Ray, Ray Youssef. I'm from New York City. I'm a New York native. I'm actually an African immigrant. My parents came over from Egypt when I was two years old for a promise of a better life in New York City. Uh, it didn't go quite as they expected. It was hard, but I learned a lot of things. I learned how to do business on the street. My parents had a newsstand, so I grew up in working in my parents' newsstand. That's where I learned how to do business from my mother. Went to Baruch College, and then I started, I got a computer. Uh, when I was 19, actually, learned how to code and started just making sites. And my first startup failed was, was Groupon with SMS messages back in 1999. I pivoted to ringtones, enormous success, completely bootstrapped. And I had another success right after that at the same time, actually. And then I took a break. I kind of, you know, did very well like that. I bought my mother a house. And then I uh, went on sabbatical. Came back because my mother got a divorce, I had to buy her a new house. And I was like, okay, I'm going to strike gold again twice in a row. I had 11 failures in a row. Wow. 10 years of my life eaten up like that. And these were really prime years. But I learned a lot, guys. Every single failure I had back then has taught me something that I need to complete this journey and this mission that I am on right now. And that is called Paxful. Paxful is a people-powered marketplace for money transfers without borders, anywhere, for anyone at any time the way it should be. So how Paxful works, it comes from need. You know, our first virtue or the value of the company is to stay connected to the streets, right? Because you have to understand the people and the problems that they have with money on a face-to-face, -face, like one-on-one -on -one basis. And then from there, you can grow and build a real business because it's based on real use cases. I'm sorry, could you step outside for a minute? I have an interview right now, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Guys. That's okay. That's fine. That's fine. It would That's not fine. be a pandemic or lockdown session without something happening happening like that. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, thankfully, it wasn't a zombie attack. It was just a friend coming over. But yes. So what Paxful is, I met this guy, this Estonian guy in New York City. His name was Artur. I met him at the first Bitcoin meetup I ever went to. It was at the Bitcoin Center in New York. We became fast friends. We tried something. Again, a uh, 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 POS for retail merchants to accept Bitcoin. Didn't work because there was no demand because there was no Bitcoin at the time. So then we pivoted to a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, right? Where people could trade things. And it was more centered around gift cards because I actually became homeless in New York. I was, uh, you know, I had burned through 11 startups of failures at that time and I was completely down. And me and my co-founder were homeless for a little while, perfect, you know, surfing on couches. That was about six and a half years ago. So, we turned to selling gift cards for Bitcoin and making profits so up to 100%. Hmm. And that got us saved. It saved our lives. It helped us build a business as well. So from there, we were like, okay, why don't we share this with everyone else? This is a gold mine. It was just hard to scale, but you can get to a point where you're making $8,000 in profit like a month, no problem. Imagine if every human being had 8,000 bucks a month just working on their computer a little bit. That would be pretty awesome, right? right. And oh, yeah. even further. So we wanted to share with people and they said, hey, we need a better system for doing this than bouncing around, um, you know, uh, Bitcoin talk and uh, local Bitcoins, and all this, something more tailored to what we needed to do. And we decided, hey, we'll build Paxful. The name Paxful actually means peace in Latin. Yep. Because we believe an honest money system can lead to a more peaceful world. And that's proven, right? When bankers can't create money out of thin air, no one wants to fight a war with no money, right? Right. Yeah. The world's it's very peace. hard to finance war. Yep. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what we didn't know at the time was that 
gift cards are actually the best way to onboard people, especially in emerging markets, right? It, because it's basically cash. You can buy it with cash and it's a, it becomes an electronic asset. You can give someone the gift card code and they can redeem it somewhere else halfway around the world. Mm. Right. It actually is a very powerful onboarding tool. And then, you know, we had our first big break kind of wig wave when I got this call at like three o'clock in the morning and uh, this lady was just yelling at me. She was screaming. She was down to her last $13 and she needed this Bitcoin. She called it, she called it Bitcoin. She didn't know how to pronounce Bitcoin. This was like a normal person, right? This wasn't a geek. geek. This is a middle-aged lady. I heard her baby, her children like crying in the background. She's about to lose her apartment. She couldn't make her rent. She had to put up an ad, which she usually bought with like a, a one vanilla Visa gift card from the store. She didn't have a bank account. She had, this was an American lady, a white lady, didn't have a bank account. There's 40 million Americans that don't have bank accounts. I never knew. And then I just started talking to all these people, learning from them, and I was blown away. And we, I turned to my co-founder and I said, yo, we have to redo everything. Why? Because I had to walk that person through every step of the process of buying Bitcoin and using it through their eyes on the phone. And I learned how to build the perfect UI for people. I'm not saying I'm, I'm building the perfect UI, but I, we turned Paxful into something optimized for people, real people, to actually get and use Bitcoin as quickly as possible. And then from there, the peoples of Africa discovered Paxful, right? And, you know, I mean, we went to Africa four years ago, before Africa was hot. You know, back then, when I was saying, when we came back after our first trip, we all believed the same thing. We said, hey, these, the African people want to move forward. They are young, they are mobily activated, they are used to online banking and they're ready for the, the promise of opportunity, right? When I saw that and all the brilliant entrepreneurs that were there, and these, some of these people are brilliant. There's like a, an army of like brilliant young people in Africa and they're so well-educated and they're so ambitious, they're looking for a path forward. All you have to do is give them that path. You know, I, I think the greatest national resource of Africa is all the brilliant young people that they have and all their ambition and enthusiasm. So when we go to them and we tell them, hey, this is something that you can use to build your own business, a lot of them got very excited. And when they saw the margins on gift cards, they were like, wow, can this actually work? And once it started working for them, and millionaires started being minted over there because of you know, Bitcoin and peer-to-peer -peer finance through Paxful. Mm -hmm. It started to catch on and then they started finding like it wasn't just a way for them to make money then other people in the same area started figuring out hey wait a minute if i can get my relative in california to buy me a thousand dollar amazon gift card and give me the code i can just sell it right here and i can get bitcoin and then i can just sell this bitcoin to another guy on the same site and get money straight to my bank account and it can be instant mm -hmm. And that's what they started doing. So they found a remittance use case and they're finding other use cases, including payments, e-commerce, it's wealth preservation as well. The Naria, the Nigerian Naria has gone down by 60% in the past four years. So we've learned a lot. And I think everything that we've learned has been from the peoples of Africa, especially the peoples of Nigeria. I have to give it up to them. You know, we gave them this open marketplace and Bitcoin and they looked at it and they saw it as a way to solve real problems. They didn't, you know, our users don't see Bitcoin as an investment vehicle. They see it as a means of exchange. And that's really what we do with Bitcoin. The, the peoples of Africa taught us is that Bitcoin, its killer app is actually as a universal translator for money, a kind of clearing layer where Bitcoin can be exchanged for anything and then anything can be exchanged for Bitcoin. So you right. can do this. At that point, you know, say Paxil supports 360 payment methods in and out, right? <clears throat> and you can say, take one of those payment methods, like an Amazon gift cards, get Bitcoin for it, then turn that Bitcoin by sell that Bitcoin to someone and get a Xbox gift card or a PayPal deposit in the UK or cash in Cambodia or Alipay, WeChat, whatever other payment method you support. You can turn one form of money anywhere into another form of money anywhere else. It's actually the, I think it's the most powerful invention yeah. many has had. I mean, maybe yeah. with electrical induction, man, it has to be. Uh, Come on. <laughs> let's talk about um, like how a, how a trade actually happens on Paxful. Like um, the first time user, you know, comes in, wants to spend their first thousand dollars maybe on their first Bitcoin. 
what I've got here is a screenshot. I, I hope you guys can see my screen. Um, what I have here is a screenshot of your um, bank transfer um, buying form. And uh, I just kind of wanted to get give people kind of a sense of what that experience looks like, right? So here, um, you, you know, I've typed in $1,000. I, I want to pay $1,000 by a bank transfer. Um, and the, you know, the site has computed how much that is in Bitcoin. Obviously, I took the screenshot like some time ago. This, the, these prices are no longer current. But um, do you, would you say that the, um, this is the kind of the, the first step for a lot of people? Like this, is this the experience? Or, or I mean, you, you spoke a lot about gift cards. Do you think that that's the, the, um, the primary way that people are using your marketplace right now? Is it gift card trading for Bitcoin? Well, Paxful has a lot of volume along bank transfers, online wallets. That's those are two of our payment method groups. Gift cards are another one of our payment method groups. Yeah. We have uh, four yeah. others. You know, we have digital currencies. You can buy digital currencies with Bitcoin. You can uh, you know, buy debit credit with Bitcoin. You can buy uh, services as well. We're adding a services marketplace and including goods and assets like gold. Mm -hmm. I bought my uh, ex-wife a Mini Cooper with Bitcoin <laughs> on Paxful, right from Berlin. Wow. So okay. You can do, these payment method groups, uh, you know, they serve as kind of a routing function there, right? So people right, right. currently on Paxful, I'd say uh, quite a big chunk of our volume is gift cards. We're known as being the gift card like marketplace we created that market. Right, right. Uh, but we also support every other. We support the most amount of payment methods in, of right, any uh, right. 360 actually, and it's yeah. growing dramatically. Yeah. In Africa alone, there's 2,000 online like payment networks. And only 3% yeah. of them are interoperable. Hmm. Interesting. I kind of wanted to highlight here, like what a Paxful transaction actually looks like so that people can kind of get, a, get their heads around this idea. But, um, you know, very much unlike the experience of maybe buying Bitcoin from uh, an app like uh, Coinbase or Cash App or whatever, on Paxful, you're actually talking to a person. Um, and that person is you know, going to sell you or buy your Bitcoin from you, depending on what the payment method that you agree on is. Um, this screenshot here is one of Paxful uh, trade chats. Um, so you call them trade chats because every trade has messages that need to be pa uh, exchanged between the, the buyer and the seller. Uh, is that right? Am I characterizing this correctly? Yes, yes, you've got it right. So yes, there is a trade chat and uh, it's by default on all trades it starts. However, what we've noticed is that uh, most people don't want to chat with anyone. They just want to do really? something quickly. Of okay. course, do something as quickly yeah. as possible, especially it's like, and you can automate yeah. many processes. For example, if you have yes. a gift card, you just you should just be able to type that into a form, hit the button, and then you should just get, get your Bitcoin. Why should you have to chat with someone, right? Mm -hmm. They might ask you, hey, upload a picture of, of the actual gift card, making sure that you have the physical copy, and maybe mm -hmm. upload a picture of the cash receipt so you know it's bought with cash. They can't charge it back with a fraudulent mm -hmm. gift card or something. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So you can ask those two things. You could automate the process, and that's what we're doing. We're automating a lot of these processes, but the chat, yes, it is there, and it's often used. Africans and Chinese love to negotiate. That's the thing. Mm. You know, you have to have to have the chats. So you notice a lot of very cultural uh, things yeah, about yeah. these systems. Right. So just thinking we should move on to Jason. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. I wish we had more time to talk about this, but I, yeah, yeah. I think I destroyed uh, all yeah, the time. I'm... Sorry, guys. No, 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 no. No, I'm... Um, I do want to uh, move on to our um, exchange one because it's also there's actually a lot of information there, um, but uh, I just wanted to kind of leave it at you know like if you're if you guys are interested in this type of um, kind of peer to peer trading, Paxful is a great place to start. Um, I, I I wholeheartedly recommend it because I spent a lot of time there myself. Um, I'm going to move really quickly now into. Um, this, this section here, uh, buying through an exchange. Um, I'm presenting this with Jason Lau. Um, he's uh, with OKCoin. He spoke a little bit earlier about kind of uh, how OKCoin started and all of that stuff. But maybe Jason, you can just kind of just, um, sure. just say a little bit more, uh, just a little bit more detail. Yeah, so we are a very typical centralized uh, custodial crypto exchange, right? We take users dollars, euros, we're regulated. Um, users have to onboard and provide identification, and then they can trade and uh, acquire Bitcoin and other current currencies. 
Um, we started in 2013 in China originally, but now we service users from all over the globe. Um, and so, you know, uh, here in the US, we just launched about 18 months ago. And uh, we're, we're currently servicing 38 states, I believe, 37 mm -hmm. states. Um, and, you know, as we expand our footprint globally, uh, you know, we, we, a lot of our users are actually a little bit more sophisticated than um, the ones that go uh, work, um, acquire Bitcoin via a gift card, for example. Um, I've used Taxhold before also, and it's fantastic um, for those type of use cases. Um, and so I'll, I'll dive right into it. I know we're short on time, um, yeah. Luis. Yeah. So, um, you know, an exchange is really, uh, is really a place where um, all sorts of market participants come together and discover a price, right? Um, what that means is there is an order book. Um, there are charts, there are order types, and there are people coming and placing what they want to do uh, whether it's buying or selling, um, at what price. And ultimately, the exchange consolidates all those um, market orders and intents of the uh, market participants, and you get you get the uh, the price that uh, is traded, the last traded price. There's um, also no chatting uh, between no chatting. buyers it's, and it's sellers. It's very <laughs> similar to trading on the stock exchange, for example, or the commodity exchange. It's, it's right. very, very, very similar. Uh, mm -hmm. So this should be instantly familiar to someone that dabbles in any sort of financial market trading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to um, quickly highlight some of the parts here. Please, um, yeah. Yeah, because the, uh, the, like for first timers, these screens tend to be very intimidating. Um, so this part that's highlighted here, this is uh, one of the charts that's telling you what the, 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 the trades the, that were, tra the, the prices that were traded at uh, were over, over the last, uh, it looks like, the last 24 hours or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Luis, I know you're going to jump around the screen here, so go go for it. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, and this is the part where um, you would do uh, the actual kind of uh, buy or sell order, right? Right. You get to type in what price you would buy, how much Bitcoin you would buy in this case. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. there it is, yeah. And then, and then here, uh, this area, this is actually the, the book part of the order book where uh, you list um, all of the currently available um, uh, offers, right? So the bids That's and the right. asks. Think of it as a bulletin board, right? Um, everyone right. who wants to buy is on one side. Everyone who wants to sell is on one side. It's organized by their price and also the amount they want to buy. If any mm -hmm. of those two orders cross, there is a trade. Right. Yeah, and that's kind of uh, the standard way that all exchanges work. And um, I guess uh, we've got a few more minutes now. I really wanted to kind of come into, like just speak to you a little bit about the pros and cons of using an exchange, especially kind of comparatively to maybe uh, what Paxful is doing, right? Um, would you agree sure. that um, Paxful is maybe easier to get into than uh, your average order book exchange? I, I mean, I, I think so, but I, I don't know what your opinion is on that. Yeah, I think um, it really depends, right? Um, okay. For us, most of our clients are institutions. They right. are businesses uh, right. and, and generally users and individuals that are generally more sophisticated. Um, mm -hmm. They probably already have traded on other platforms before in the traditional financial market space. Um, right. And so in that sense, this is very, very straightforward. But I agree, for, for a regular user who wants to buy $5 worth of Bitcoin, this is probably not the most um, intuitive right. way for someone to do so, right? Um, right. They just want to know the price and how do I pay? And Paxful right. does a brilliant job of, of, of uh, onboarding and, and, and doing right. that. Um, I guess what, one of the other uh, differences that I noticed also was that um, when you trade on Paxful, you're kind of, uh, what, what the price is at that moment in time, that's the price that you would be trading at uh, mm -hmm. normally. Whereas with a, an order book, you can actually set a price in the future. Um, that's right that you want to kind of aim for, let's say, oh, I want to wait until Bitcoin dumps by like 15% or whatever. Before Absolutely I buy. right, yeah. That, that's a possible um, And that's aim. what, that's actually what a lot of our users do, right? They, that's why you see orders that rest on the order book down to 7,000 in this case, all the way down to 5,000. Um, and and it, the exchange allows users to put very sophisticated orders, right? They can say mm -hmm. things like, hey, I just want to buy, uh, I, I want to buy hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, but I only want to buy a dollar every hour. And it'll do all that for you because you don't know what the average price is over the next, whatever, 24 right. hours or something. Right. Um, 
I, I'm going to go through some of your points here, Luis. Um, yes, please. Yes, getting please. close in time. Deeper yeah. liquidity is one of the key key um, uh, reasons why someone would come to an exchange. If you want to buy uh, 50 Bitcoin, for example, right? $500,000 worth. You can come to our site and not move the price very much. Uh, I looked at just this morning, I looked at sort of how much liquidity there is around mid, sort of the, the last cleared price. Mm -hmm. uh, right around 1% of that, there's about 90 Bitcoin worth um, of liquidity available. So someone could come and buy, make very large orders and not really get a disadvantageous price. Um, right. These are, are the other part. I think uh, we charge something like 15 basis points, which is 0 .0, sorry, 0.15 of a percent on that mm -hmm. transaction, which yep. I, I don't know what Paxful charges, but I know Coinbase, if you were just a retail user, they would charge anywhere from 1% to 1.5%. Uh, so it's anywhere from eight, uh, sort of seven to 10 times more expensive. Mm. Um, right. And then we mentioned sort of the sophisticated order types the other part is we do hold your crypto and your fiat. You deposit Bitcoin and dollars and euros with us. So we are a purely custodial entity. And you, mm -hmm. you went through some of the pros and cons of that. Um, yeah. and, and with that comes with all the compliance requirements that we as a regulated entity have to abide by, right? Um, right. Which means we ask entities like yourselves, Luis uh, Bloom, to provide mm -hmm. you know, your certificate of incorporation and, and Whole bunch of things whereby uh, we, we get very comfortable with uh, what type of business you are and, and we need to know who you are. I right, think that that's right. generally the trade-off here. Yeah, right. Um, Ray, I wanted to give you like a quick, just a, a quick chance to jump in. Um, the, the difference between you guys and an exchange is with an exchange, they hold both the crypto and the fiat on behalf of their users. That's not the case with Paxful, right? Exactly. That's a brilliant way to put it. They're both escrow services, right? But mm -hmm. Paxful with peer-to-peer, -peer, we can't escrow the non-crypto side, right? Right. We can't yeah. escrow the gift card. Or we can to a certain extent, but is it only because it's a digital asset, right? But you can mm -hmm. you can trade that for PayPal. We can't escrow PayPal money or bank yeah. transfer money because we don't have a bank account. We don't have a PayPal account. We don't have any right. of those accounts. We leave that to our peers to do that. So it's kind of like a... The peer is the escrow, right? You know, right. he's kind of escrowing the funds or holding the funds rather, but you don't know if the funds are good and you don't know if the gift card is good, right? So you can't do fraud on an okay coin, right? Like the both assets are there, right? There's no fraud to be had unless you're trying to hack the system. On Paxwell, the fiat side is always subject to chargeback. With enough political will, any method of payment is chargeback or it can be charged back, right? Mm. And that's what we right. see. And that's our biggest challenge, especially in emerging markets, which are known for very high fraud rates, right? So it's a, it's a different kind of challenge, you know, the, mm -hmm. than building a programmable continuous limit order book, right? Yeah, it's more, right, uh, of course. Yeah, different. Yeah. Right. We, we, we see people try uh, to, to do fraud on our system, too, especially, like you said, from emerging markets. And yeah, yeah you're right. It's, it's, it's a little tougher on our side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's I'm not just... a lot. Sorry, I'm going to jump in here just because we don't have very many minutes left. Um, I'm going to sort of outro this session. Thank you, everyone who was on this session, both at the beginning and here at the end for the why and how of buying Bitcoin. I know that was you know, coming at you fast, whoever is watching. So all of these guys are, they should be in the Brella system so you can reach out to them there or find them on Twitter. That's probably where they hang out all day, much like everyone in crypto. Um, just a quick announcement. If you are confused why you were here, this is Consensus Distributed. Again, over the next five days, we will have talks like this one. Um, we have a Coindesk TV track, which is just quick hits, getting people in and out. This track um, specifically is Crypto Unlocked. Um, this is all about learning, so hands-on, um, getting newbies uh, set up to be ultimate crypto users, getting people like myself, um, who knows a lot about these systems, but who hasn't had time to play with the technology, you know, getting me experimenting with this stuff. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks again to all the hosts. And we will be back in like two minutes with another Unlock session. And that is Thank called you, Mad Bailey. Mesh. Thank you very much. Yes, that thanks, is called guys. Mad Mesh. And that will be with uh, the Go Tenna folks. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, like Bailey said, please feel free to reach out if you have questions. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, everyone.